Hello, everyone. We are kicking off two days of wall-to-wall, back-to-back coverage of UiPath Forward 2024. We're here on theCUBE. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host and analyst, Dave Vellante. Hey, Rebecca. Hello, good to see you again. Good. We, we keep meeting here. Yeah, good. <laughs> uh, hey, what, what, what better place to meet than Las Vegas? Well, at, Actually, at, it's October and the weather is, is, it's, is stunning. But, it, it is, yeah, it is, it yeah. is. So we are both fresh from the keynote. We both just, just sat through Mary Tetlow, uh, Bobby Patrick, of course, Daniel Dines, the boss of the bots, as, as, yep. he's, as he's named here. Boss of the bots, um, that's good. I'd love to just hear your thoughts and impressions. I mean, obviously the, the theme is really about transforming businesses with AI, showing what AI powered automation looks like and how it is, it is the future of work. What what you, what you think of it? What'd you make of it? Yeah, UiPath is an interesting company, isn't it? I mean, they started as a humble consultancy. They realized they had lightning in a bottle in 2015. They sort of really relaunched the company. And then, as you well know, they soared. Uh, they ran up to a, a, a valuation that was off the charts. And then they went public. They, got, they went public during the pandemic on the NYSE and you know, have had some really interesting, uh, uh, an interesting journey, let's put it that way. Um, I think the board felt like at one point, <clears throat> hey, we need to bring in some adult supervision, because Daniel you know, you know, was a product guy. Um, that didn't work out the way they had thought. Daniel Genes is back as a CEO. He's a true product visionary, and we heard him up there on stage today. Um, the company has about a billion and a half plus in ARR, they're growing at uh, almost 20% per year, and a pretty good retention rate. They've got, I think, 10,000 customers. So, <clears throat> so many of them are here today. And I think what we heard was, this is act two for UiPath. Act one was RPA, where they dominated. Now, between act one and act two, there was sort of act 1A, <laughs> where okay. UiPath emerged from, from, or evolved from really a point product company, just doing robotic process automation, to one that was doing end-to-end -end automation. They made a number of acquisitions in the process automation area, like Process Gold, they made some AI acquisitions, and so they really set out on this hyper-automation, end-to-end enterprise automation uh, path, and then, boom, Gen AI hits. So the AI heard around the world, Daniel's right, they were doing AI for a long, long time. Uh, they started with computer vision, they had machine learning, et cetera, but then Gen AI has changed everything. If you can interact with a natural language uh, and there's all this wonderful potential with AI, I think people looked at it and said, well, why do we need RPA? I think people are finding out that it's harder than they thought to implement AI in a, in a, in a, in a way in which enterprises expect. So act two is all about going beyond bots into agents, and what Daniel laid out today was a case that you need bots and agents together, and that was interesting. I mean, I do largely agree. RPA is sort of like the plumbing. Um, you know, without it, the water will be spraying everywhere. And so, the case that he made today was, you know, these agents have to evolve over time. They have to be governed, and the bots will help with that governance, because they're basically rules-based. They say, do this, then that, and they don't break those rules. Whereas, as we know, AI sometimes does what it wants. So, we're in the early days of agents. Can you trust those agents with your, the example I gave, can you trust the agent with your passport? You know, and all your credit card information. Maybe, maybe we let the bots handle that and give bits and pieces of the, that information to the agents. Let the bots execute on all the private stuff. So bots and agents and humans working together was sort of the vision he laid out, but he did say that over time we want to really try to eliminate as much human interaction as possible with all the mundane stuff. So my take is that we're entering a new era, that's no shock to anybody, and the application stack is about to completely change. And UiPath hopes to play a major role in that agent orchestration layer. And we could talk more about how we see that changing, what the role of AI is, things like causal AI, how to harmonize the data, the whole you know, agent orchestration framework, backend connections, all that stuff is increasingly important. And UiPath today is playing, has its fingers in a lot of those pies. 
Indeed, and a lot of what you were just saying really resonated with what we heard on the main stage this morning. Mm -hmm. I think Mary Tetlow, who is the chief brand officer, made a similar analogy. She, she quoted Daniel Dune saying, what is Automi automation without AI or AI without automation, I can't have my brain without my body. And really the combination of the two is bringing together this left brain, right brain combination of the left brain being more analytical, being uh, doing that kind of critical analysis, the, 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 the automated tasks, the right brain bringing the more the creativity, the innovation, bringing them together and, and that is what in fact and then deploying that at the enterprise enterprise scale. So th that is the challenge before them. Yeah, and when you know they have ten thousand plus customers, so that's that's good news, and they have a great product. Um, they've ebbed and flowed with go to market. Um, I mean, I think you know at one point they're really trying to sell to the C suite, and I think. For UiPath, that's what, where partnerships come in. When you're working with some of these GSIs and, and other partners that have access to that C-suite, I think that's a good role for the partners and I think UiPath is the product, has, brings the product expertise. Um, but you saw it, every forward that I've ever been to, it starts with the customer. And they have this really cool way of, the customers actually kick off the Event. Yeah. You know, that's the only event where I've seen that consistently, where you have customers standing up, introducing themselves, uh, telling a story about who they are, uh, you know, what their automation goals are. That's, that's where virtually every forward I've been to starts, and it's unique. And it, it is, and it's incredibly powerful, as you say. We had, we had someone from Omega Healthcare. Her, her quote of the day is, healthcare in America runs on paperwork. Yeah, we yeah, know. We know. <laughs> as, any, right. as anyone who's ever received <laughs> medical care in this country knows. Um, and, and showing how it, she's, they've reduced turnaround times, increased efficiency at Omega Healthcare. Uh, Ernst & Young, uh, an image company talking about um, eliminating the invoice backlog. But most interestingly, he made the point that this is relieving stress from employees. I think that that was a message that really came out loud and clear is that people are overworked, let, let, this, let these new processes, these new systems help relieve some of those burdens. You know, I got to ask you, because you, this is your wheelhouse, so sort of the new way to work, future of work. Stu and I, I think it was 2015, we did a show in London with um, the guys who wrote 2MA, Second Machine Age. It was uh, uh, Andy McAfee and, and Eric Brynjolfsson from MIT. Who's now at Stanford, Eric. Eric is now at Stanford, <laughs> right. And so the premise of the, of the book essentially was that, that machines have always replaced humans uh, over the course of history and that's led to greater productivity and you know, more wealth and growth and more jobs. But this is the first time ever that that we're replacing humans in cognitive functions. And so there was a little bit of fuzziness there. And one thing struck me is they made the point that it wasn't too long ago that robots couldn't climb stairs. And they certainly can climb stairs today. They could do a lot more than that. And so uh, Brynjolfsson said, we make a list every year of the things that humans can do that machines can't do. And that list is getting less and less. And with Gen AI, it's really getting a lot less. And so this is quite amazing. Now, the optimists would say, look, it's just another wave, and there may be some short-term pain, but there's always in these waves been long-term gain. At the same time, you hear things like universal basic income and artificial general intelligence, and you know this, this utopian vision of we're all kind of sitting around just living life. Um, maybe we're quite, quite some ways away from that. Um, but what's your take, what is your, <clears throat> What does your, your, your research, your, your writings, your gut feel tell you about this transition from you know, where we were pre-chat GPT to this new world of AI? I think that, that what we're hearing, I, th I think it was even the magician at the very beginning who was doing a little pre-entertainment <laughs> was talking about who's going to take our jobs. It's, it's not AI that's going to take our jobs. It's the people who know how to work with AI. And I think that yes, that is in general true because we humans are, are going to be around and we're going to need something to do. So I do think that we will, there will be some short-term pain, as you said, there will be some jobs dislocation. We, there already has been, frankly. Um, that will continue, but I think also as this technology evolves, we will find new, exciting ways to work with the technology because 
we're already seeing research coming out of MIT, coming out of Stanford, about how humans can work together with AI and what, under what circumstances, what are the best practices with that. And for the longest time, we thought, oh, it, it's humans that can bring the creativity, the empathy, but in fact, as you just pointed out, AI does that pretty well too. There's really interesting research about, do you prefer to get medical information and advice from your doctor or from, from an AI bot? Even when you know it's an AI bot, research says that, well, the AI bot listens to me. The AI bot is, is, is more um, fully answering my question. And engaged. Exactly. <laughs> and we've all met some doctors with some questionable bedside manners, so I get it. So, um, and I, but I also think that the creativity being, I mean, we've seen incredible images that AI ha has created. It's just mind-blowing creativity that AI is showing. But I do think that maybe working with humans is, is the answer there, is that in fact, having AI iterate and test and try and, and add different things. A human maybe does the first draft or AI does the first draft. And then bringing the human brain in there because the one thing that AI will never know how to do is how to live a human life. Because this is what we bring to the table. We bring that experience, that judgment, and that humanity to, to all of this. So what do you think that work. means for, for jobs? Because that's where the, 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 the media journalists often always, almost always go to that loss of jobs. It's certainly a concern in, in Europe. It's a concern in Hollywood. It's a concern in the manufacturing industries. It's, and it's a legitimate concern. You know, the, the, the last big, big, really meaningful productivity boom that I can remember was really the PCs. I mean, it brought in a massive, massive productivity renaissance. And there were others in between. I'm not sure the internet had the same effect. It, it, I have to look at the numbers. But the hope is that AI actually produces that. And you know, people are concerned about the debt, the national debt, productivity potentially drives more growth. Growth generally drives more jobs. Do you, do you think that will be the case this time around? I do. I do. I'm very, I'm optimistic that it is going to lead to, to a boon in productivity. If you just think about your everyday existence, a lot of us are drowning in admin. We're drowning in admin at work, but we're also drowning in it in our personal lives. I can't tell you how many apps I have to deal with to register my children for sports and tournaments and various, and, and submitting different forms here and there. And that's just their sports, that no, not alone their other extracurricular activities right. and their schoolwork. So just the, the fact that I have to deal with all of that, and I'm just one human being who also works a job, Think about all of that at a massive scale. And if you can, in fact, if AI can eliminate that from our lives, it does give us more time to, to focus on the work that matters and to focus on our, our actual human beings in our lives that right, matters. So, so hey, I'm really excited. Hey AI, sign up my, my kid for, <laughs> my son for basketball, my daughter for, for volleyball, my other son for music, you know, just do it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, exactly. We maybe yeah. can't, trust him, can't, can't trust it quite yet with all of our sensitive um, identification details and credit card information, but we're getting there. Yeah, now so, um, I want to come back to the, what we were talking about before, I alluded to at the end of my rant on the application stack. And so if you think about the, the way in which applications are constructed today, you've got the infrastructure, which is, you know, let's call it cloud infrastructure. Whether that's, that's public cloud or on-prem, it's a, it's a cloud-like experience. And then on top of that, there's a, there are data, there's, there are data platforms, okay? So there's things like, Snowflake or Oracle is databases. And those databases can be analytical in nature or they can be operational or transaction in nature and they're largely stovepipe and you build applications on top of that. You know, there's some middleware and then you've got apps, whether it's human resource or a, a, a CRM or ERP or financial apps or on and on and on. And all these apps contain business logic, they contain data, they contain metadata. Um, and within their own domain, they work pretty well. They, they tend not to work well across domains, as, as we know. Um, it, some companies are, have done a better job than others in sort of integrating, but generally speaking, we've created a world of application stovepipes. And the vision for Agentic is we're going to el eliminate those stovepipes. We're going to create digital representations of our business that in real time, essentially a digital twin, that can represent our business and identify changes in the business and respond accordingly. With agents, swarms of agents that are working together that can make plans and, and present plans to humans that humans in the loop can approve or adjust. And then ultimately, 
execute uh, against top-down goals, increase revenue, but don't lose money. You know? <laughs> Keep margins at 30% or better, it's, you know, but gain share. Um, and give me a plan to do that. And then execute that plan bottom up. Well, so what do you need to do that? You need connectors to back-end systems like Salesforce and Oracle and SAP, et cetera. You need a data layer, for sure. That's not UiPath, but there has to be a data layer there. And then you need a way to take all that disparate data and harmonize it so that revenue actually means revenue. It doesn't mean bookings. It doesn't mean NRR or ARR or quarterly revenue or annual revenue. So we're not arguing about that. There's, there's trust in the data. And we've never had a single version of the truth in, in technology. Maybe we'll get there. And then, but that harmonized data then gets served up to the agents and the agents are orchestrated, they're managed, they're governed, they're secure, and there's an agent control framework that can do that, that can understand the top-down goals, execute the bottom-up, and be a digital representation of the business. That is the vision for the future. And then, oh, by the way, if you really want to get exciting, throw in things like causal AI. So we know that there are relationships in data, uh, but is it cause and effect? Well, AI is emerging, causal AI they call it, that can actually understand cause and effect, which maybe humans sometimes can't. We can see patterns in data, we can see correlations in data, we can make statistical correlations, we can run Monte Carlo modeling based on those correlations, um, but is it cause and effect? Okay, so this is, this is I think, going to take eight to 10 years to evolve, but I think it, it will happen. So why, is, why am I talking about this? UiPath, as I said, has the plumbing. It has all these bots and automations running around that are pretty proven and trusted. And it's building out this agent control framework, which is a very high value piece of real estate, um, to be able to execute on that vision. And so this is why they talk about Act Two. Act Two for UiPath is around that agent control framework, agent orchestration, and the important thing is it's not only, it not only includes data, um, it's also got to include the data, the metadata, the business logic, but also has to include the processes. And that's where UiPath, I think, has a great potential because they understand processes. They made some acquisitions years ago around process gold and process automation. Um, and so to the extent that you can incorporate that into your agent control framework, and then the agents can learn from humans over time through computer vision and other AI and machine intelligence, then new processes can be developed. And this is how I think existing incumbents become more AI burst and new companies become or are born that are AI native. And that brings us back to the productivity boon. If that can happen, then you, this is David Floyer's premises, you're now executing on business tasks and running businesses at one-tenth the cost and you know, 10x, at 10x the speed. And that's a new world. With more certainty, in fact, that what you're seeing is in fact what's happening. Which yeah, I think and is we should caution, none of this works today. Yeah, in that, <laughs> exactly. In that sense, I mean, it's exactly. just, we, today it's a, a, a lot of single agent co-pilots, it's LLMs that hallucinate, um, it's you know, a lot of deterministic capabilities that, that are you know, rules-based, but we're laying out a vision, and it's early, of this new world, and it's going to take, I, I really do believe it's going to take a decade to evolve, not only the technology, you know, the technology to harmonize all this data, the, to control these agents, to, to make all these back-end connections, you know, some of that exists through APIs, it's not microservices, microservices are hard-coded, but the technology is going to take some time. But beyond the technology, getting people to actually adopt it, uh, understanding the processes, um, making sure that you know, you're managing risk, you know, the governance and the compliance piece of that, that, that is going to take a long time to evolve. Indeed, well Dave, I'm so excited to be here for two days of, of UiPath coverage. Lots of great announcements, we're having many customers on, we're going to be talking about AI in healthcare, AI in consulting, AI in, at Coca-Cola. It's, it's going to be a great show and I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, they're this. always a, a, good, a great guest of ours. Some bottler comes on, either Coca-Cola itself or some region of the world that you, oh wow, of course, Coca-Cola's everywhere. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, folks from, like you say, from healthcare, 
We've got um, you know, partners coming on. We've got some analysts coming on. We have an analyst from Forrester. We have another one, I think, from IDC. Uh, another one from Constellation Research. Um, and yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be an action-packed show, two days as you say, of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Rebecca. Indeed, well, yeah. I look forward to it. Ditto. And you stay tuned to theCUBE. You are watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis. We'll be right back with more from UiPath Forward.